Benthicids. Welcome to the Benthic Macroinvertebrates Notes. If this is your first time here, we get ready to write a lot of things down. If you've already watched this presentation and just wanted to review or get, what you, get a few things that you missed, then feel free to skip ahead or stop and rewind and do all that sort of, sort of thing. Well, we're going to start with the definition of this, these two unfamiliar words, benthic macroinvertebrates. So let's take the words apart. Piece by piece, benthic comes from the Greek word benthos, which means bottom of the stream. Then macro means small, but large enough to see without a microscope. And invertebrates, you probably already know, are animals that do not have a backbone. So if we put those three parts together, the definition becomes any small animal with no backbone that lives in shallow water. So that could be a lot of different things, and I always like to clarify. How about a fish? Is a fish a benthic macroinvertebrate? Think about it. Well, they do have a backbone. So no, they would not be called the benthic macroinvertebrate. Okay, let's think of something else that has no backbone. How about an ant? Let's, well, ants don't have a backbone. They are small, but they don't live in shallow waters. So we would just call them a plain old macroinvertebrate. Benthic macroinvertebrates are, are the, anything that lives in a shallow water and has no backbone. Some of the most familiar ones that would, you, would, you would probably know would be snails, leeches, um, larva of insects that sw swim through the water before they become adults. So, why does it matter? Why are we talking about benthic macroinvertebrates? Well, as you know, we're going to be doing the Rouge River study soon, and we're going to be taking samples of benthic macroinvertebrates. The reason is that benthics can tell us a lot about the water. That some of them are very sensitive to changes, and those changes are, are especially things like pollution. So if the water is very polluted, we would probably not find any of them. And if we did find some, that's a good thing. If we find a lot of them, that's a great thing. So that's why we look. And of course, if we don't find any, that doesn't really mean much. It could just be we had a bad day and couldn't find them. Or it could mean that they got eaten by a predator. But what we are really looking for is finding them. And we have a whole system for how to identify them, and, how, and we have a way of giving the river kind of like a grade to see how healthy it is. Now, scientists, when they have studied these organisms, they just uh, classified them into three different groups based on how sensitive they are to changes. The first group is a very unusual highly creative name. They call the first group of organisms group one. And the group one organisms are sensitive. They will die very easily if something in their environment has changed. Now notice I didn't say they die easily if their environment is polluted. It could be anything. Now even temperature. And so if the water temperature suddenly got higher for some reason like, for example, say somebody chopped down a bunch of trees and now the sun is constantly shining on the, the, the river, then they might actually die if the temperature, average temperature goes up by 10 to 20 degrees. So they're very sensitive, they're very weak, and of course if there's pollution, they're even more affected. So finding them would mean a, a lot of good things were happening. So I like to show this picture of this guy, he's kind of weak, he's kind of pathetic, like a like a group one organism, not very strong. Group two are somewhat sensitive, and they're a little tougher than group one, but not as tough as others. They will still die if there's an extreme change, of course, but instead of 10 to 20 degrees higher, they might die from 25 to 30 degrees higher, but um, they're very uh, helpful to still study, but they're a little bit in between not as weak as the other guys. And then the final group, of course, is called Group 3. Group 3 are tolerant. They can adapt very easily to most changes. Now, they're not superbugs. If you boil some water, they're going to die. If you pour bleach in the water, they're going to die. 
but they're a little more tolerant than the others. Part of the reason they can be so tolerant is that many of them have lungs. And if they have lungs and the river is polluted, what can they do? They can leave. They can go to another river. They can go to a pond. They can just get out of there until the water starts to cool down or, if, or the water is not as polluted. So that's what, part of what makes them group three. Now the rest, if they don't have lungs, they have gills, and they're, they can still be tolerant with gills. But those guys are just happen to be uh, a lot tougher. This guy. So, what are we going to do? Or what are we doing while we're out there studying? Well, our job as the sixth grade is to collect and identify them. That's it. The whole hour that we're outside for the Rouge study, we will be having different jobs, and some of us will be getting organisms from the water, and others will be identifying them and trying to figure it out, what, what we found. And then, based on what we find, we give the river a grade. Before we can do anything, though, we've got to know what to look for and where to find them. And I need to give you some background information about the life of macroinvertebrate. It's a very interesting life. Most bed ticks that we find will be either nymphs or larvae. And you probably never heard of these two terms, but let me define it for you. A larva is a newly hatched, wingless, often worm-like insect. And it's uh, just basically what it looks like as a baby, right out of the egg. And the most famous larva that you probably know of is a caterpillar. A caterpillar comes out of the egg looking like a worm, crawls around, eats leaves, but then goes through this drastic change, this cocoon stage, this metamorphosis, and suddenly it looks like a totally different thing. It's got wings, it's beautiful, it flies around, and it drinks nectar from flowers. So that's a metamorphosis. And, but many of the ones that we find in the river will, will not be as cute as a caterpillar, but they, um, they, when they become an adult, they will look totally different. They'll have wings, they may eat totally different things, and, but they're still the same insect. A nymph is kind of like an in-between stage that some of these insects go through. Uh, they call it an immature form of the adult. So some skip the larva stage completely, like they go right from egg to nymph. Others just uh, skip the nymph stage and go from larva to adult. But it's just sometimes we find these nymphs, and they, again, look different from the adult, but they're the same organism. Another thing you should know before we start is what their body plan is like, because I'll be using some terms like abdomen and thorax. And the head is, of course, the part with the eyes and the antenna and the mouth parts. The thorax is in the center. That's where all the legs are attached. And if they had wings, that's where the wings would be attached also. But the abdomen is kind of like the rear end. For humans, the abdomen is in the middle. But for insects, it's at the end. And in the abdomen is all, all the vital organs, sometimes the lungs, sometimes gills, digestive organs, reproductive organs, sometimes even their heart is in the abdomen. So, before I move on, I'm going to start, I'm going to stop this here. This is part one. And at part two, I'm going to show you all the different examples and tell you how to write them down and what you'll need to know before the actual study. So thank you for watching part one.